People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 114. On today's show, we talk about Egypt, Peru, and China in prehistory and what they have in common. You might be surprised. Let's dig a little deeper. Well, welcome to the show, everyone. I'm here with Rachel, my wife. Hello. As I always am, we live in a 300 square foot RV. (laughs) True story. (laughs) We're both always in the same location at all times. Yes. Yes. Let's not talk about that, though. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of things that are in the same time period at all times, I mentioned on a couple previous episodes that we were going to be working on some interesting episode ideas that we've had. Yeah. So I'll let Rachel explain it to you. Yeah, we had this idea where it would be interesting to take a look at the same time period in the world across different continents and different civilizations and see what was happening when one major civilization was having a big, important period. For example, Egypt, which is one of the ones we're going to talk about today. So what was happening in Egypt while they were building the pyramids in the rest of the world? Because I think that when a civilization has something as big and important and just like in your face on the landscape, like the pyramids are, I think when something like that is out there, it can kind of overshadow what was going on in the rest of the world sometimes. Yeah. And not just overshadow, it also can be surprising what other amazing things were happening in the rest of the world, too. Like, you don't even think about what is happening at the same time as the pyramids are being built or whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's like the pyramids are being built, Stonehenge is being built, you know, China's doing awesome things. Yeah. People are doing stuff in the Americas, South America, all over the world. And we tend to look at these in prehistory as independent events, Mm -hmm. like they're... Like they're just happening because they're in a textbook and we're learning about them and they're right here. But in some cases, they're happening at the exact same time. Right. And there's these, it's hard to think about in today's society because we're all so interconnected. I mean, we know seconds after it happens, something major that happens on the other side of the planet. I routinely have calls in my work with people in Australia who live in Tomorrowland. It's a weird (laughs) time zone thing, right? (laughs) Like they're ahead of me in the future and yet we have conversations on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that made me think about doing this idea is if you've ever been to Northern California and you've seen any redwoods, there's always some sliced up redwood somewhere as a display and they show the tree rings. And, and if you're familiar with tree ring dating, you know, the tree rings grow based on seasons and you can tell how old a tree is by counting its rings. And there's always some display that says, you know, here's where Jesus was born when this tree was here. Here's when, you know, this happened. Here's Pompeii. Mm -hmm. Here's, you know, the founding of the UK. Here's, you know, something else. And they put these timelines on this tree. And I'm just thinking, man, all this is going on. And this tree is just over here like, I'm just living. (laughs) Well, and even more than that is they always choose to put these really big, awesome, important events on the tree rings and it again it just sort of 
not dismisses, but it just pushes all the other important things that are happening in the world over to the side. Like, oh, but you're not as important as this thing here right. on the timeline. Right. And so we just wanted to shed some light on some of those things that might have been considered less important, perhaps less interesting, but right. we don't think so. So that's the idea. So how this works is we pick like an anchor time period or anchor civilization or something everybody knows about, right? right. Like, like for example, we said Pompeii, you know, something like that where it's a, it's a well-known thing. What else was happening at that time? So we've structured this episode to talk about three different things. The first one is something that a lot of people know about, but maybe not have the depth of knowledge that we're going to give you and some of the finer details, but basically the building of the Great Pyramids in Egypt. Correct. Yeah. And I know that we learned about this in school and everything, but I don't know about y'all, but for me, that was like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Let's not talk about that. So (laughs) for me, researching this was, it was just a way for me to reconnect with something that I know I had learned at some point but had forgotten. So starting with the time period, we're talking about roughly 2600 to 2500 BCE. And that is during the old kingdom period in ancient Egypt. And to back up just for a second, there's the period that leads up to the old kingdom is the early dynastic period. It ends around 2613 Mm -hmm. and they started building some pyramids and stuff in that time frame. So during the early dynastic period, The pharaohs had started trying to build pyramids. We had the Saqqara Step Pyramid, which is exactly what you would think of. It goes up in steps up to the top because they couldn't quite get flat sides yet. It was before they learned how to cut the little pyramids off the side (laughs) to to make it smooth. Right. Or to like encase it in limestone or whatever. (laughs) But yeah. And that was right at the end of the early dynastic period. I really struggle with these periods because they (laughs) kind of don't make sense. Like what's early dynastic and then to old kingdom and then to new kingdom and just like, okay, anyway, Mm -hmm. having a little (laughs) time period rant for a second. On to the next one. Incidentally, if there's any Egyptologists listening to this, we'd love to have an Egyptology podcast on the Archaeology Podcast Network. Yes. Also, shut your <laughs> shut your ears. ears for the next like 15 <laughs> or so minutes because probably we're going to gloss over this yeah. briefly, which we have to because we just don't have time to go in right. super in depth. But anyway, moving on. So the early dynastic period ends the... Old Kingdom begins around 2613, and that's when the pharaohs really get into heavy pyramid building. The first one, and this was after several failed attempts, but finally, King Snefero built the Red Pyramid. Man, what does a failed attempt look like? Uh, one of them, like, kind of collapsed on itself, I think, and there's a couple others they've got that chambers just, inside. Probably, yeah, yeah. 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 They just, mm. for whatever reason, the like geometry of the architecture just didn't work and they and they failed. I imagine that's not easy to get right either. Yeah. And the Red Pyramid is, it looks rougher than the ones mm-hmm. at Giza that we've all seen. So moving on to Giza, that's where we get these big monumental pyramids that everybody's seen pictures of and that everybody studies in school. They were built, the biggest one was built by Khufu and then we also have Khafre's Pyramid and then the smallest one is Mankare. And they were all kind of in the same time frame, like within like a 90 year period or something like that. It was this flurry of pyramid building that just it ended. But what I think is even more important to that than that is what was going on in the society that allowed these mm-hmm. pyramids to be built, because it's such a display of wealth and power that only a really organized and really rich Mm-hmm. government and civilization would be able to carry out. So that's what I think is the most important thing that is going on there. It is located on the Giza Plateau near Cairo and it was oh it's a 60 period time 60 year time period that they built these in the old kingdom. 60 years. Yeah, 60 years, which it's partly because of this transition to worshiping the pharaoh as the sun god basically that like sun cult thing the cult of Mm -hmm. Ra was happening at that time period and i think there's a lot of like egoism stuff going on with these rulers they were super arrogant and it was like their right to have this giant monument constructed funeral monument constructed to honor them after their their deaths i mean they started building them before you know 
when they took power, essentially. So, yeah, and some of you may have heard of this or not. I don't necessarily subscribe to this because I don't think we could uh, really prove it. But there are some that think that the organization and orientation of the the big three pyramids at uh, Giza line up with the main three stars in Orion's belt, the constellation Orion. I don't know if that. I mean, there's there seems to be almost no way that we could actually prove that, right? But there and there's a lot of coincidences in the world just because geometry is a thing, yeah, and uh, things line up like that. But I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, from what I was gathering from my research is that yes, that's possible, but their main reasoning seems to be just like both showing up the ruler before them. <laughs> yeah, like Menkare has the smallest pyramid but he's got the most expansive like supporting structures around it Mm -hmm. like funerary complex essentially so yeah it almost seems like it was like a one-upmanship kind of thing like oh i see what you did there but i'm gonna do this and that kind of thing so anyway um yeah like we were saying that it just it took so much money the logistics were incredible they needed so many laborers and just a quick side note they did not use slave labor to build the pyramids. Bible. What? <laughs> it was written in the Bible, obviously, because they were trying to make one group of people look like they were like the beleaguer- beleaguered group, right? Mm-hmm. But we have extreme levels of evidence that the people who were building these pyramids were not malnourished. They were not badly treated. They were there of their own accord and they were doing it for money and food. So Mm -hmm. it was a workforce. It was a job. Yeah. Part of the reason is because of the flood season around the Nile, which was all the area that Egypt controlled, the flood season left them two to three months where they had nothing to do while the the river was flooding. So, you know, they'd show up at the Pharaoh's office and say, yo, (laughs) give me some work. At the at the Pharaoh's office? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're gonna call my office on CRM projects from now on. The Pharaoh's office. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, if you want to get technical about it, there's a guy called the Vizier who was just below the Pharaoh, and he was like the logistics yeah. organizer for pyramid building. I saw Aladdin. The Vizier is always evil. <laughs> so there you go. Yep. The grand vizier. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to get that point across that slaves there was there was there were slaves in Egypt yes that that was a thing but primarily regular old laborers were used to build the pyramids and there's mm-hmm. a lot of proof of that nice yeah so that's the basic construction and, and idea behind the pyramids in this time frame but is there anything that connects this society to the next two that we're going to talk about yeah so I looked at sort of five major points of comparison right? And not all these things are the same. Some are different, but they are, most of them are things that we have information across all three of the time periods that we're looking at, or all three of the civilizations that we're looking at. So the first one was agriculture, because of course we're talking about, you know, Neolithic societies here. They are heavily into agriculture this time period, you know, 2600, 2500 BCE. Mm -hmm. They're for sure growing food. And Egypt had a very extensive agriculture system going on. And in fact, the entire land associated with Egypt, the upper and lower area, it was all right around the Nile. The entire area was around the Nile. So their whole society was built around the water and the irrigation and agriculture and stuff associated with the Nile. So they actually developed a process called basin irrigation and they would build these earthen walls that trapped the water when the Nile flooded seasonally, as we mentioned earlier. And then they used that water to grow the staple foods like wheat, beans, lentils, roots and veggies. And they even had fruit and things like dates, sorghum. I think I read watermelon. I mean, Mm. I know. So like they were, as far as vegetables go, they were like living it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So Agriculture wise, they for sure were a very complex society. They were developing processes and just super developed there. As far as relationship with other groups and other communities around them, they were generally a peaceful society, which you might not think, given what you read in the Bible and in other not so historical places. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were overall pe- overall peaceful because 
They had to be in order to have so much excess money in order to build monuments like this. It's because they weren't spending that money to Mm -hmm. go out and war with other places. Now, they did expand to the south a little bit as far as the Sudan, probably just along the Nile. They just wanted to keep sucking up those chunks of (laughs) chunks of land right next to the Nile. Riverfront property. (laughs) Riverfront property. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, where would you build your pyramid? I I mean, seriously, you know, water is everything. Yeah. Yeah. So then the third point of comparison is going to be religion. And we do know, of course, that they had the cult of Ra, worshiping the sun god or worshiping the pharaoh as the sun god. That was their dominant religion. And the pharaoh was the embodiment of that deity. And everything in the whole pyramid area was very focused on that. So population. This is a bit debatable. There was one researcher who went through some really impressive and complex calculations to get to a population of 1.6 million. Hmm. That sounds huge to me. Yeah. That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. Now the whole area was very big all the way down into, you know, middle, practically the middle of Africa along the Nile. So it's possible there is that many people, but yeah, it's likely it was structured much like it is today with just like the huge population centers being right down the river. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But 1.6 does seem a little bit big and it's, Definitely a number that is contested, but how can you prove otherwise either? Yeah. So we'll just go with that for now. And then the last point of comparison is the language and writing of the people in that area. And they, of course, we know they had language because of the hieroglyphs that we find that we find carved in all the tombs. And so, of course, they had a spoken language as well. And it's probably an Afro-Asiatic language, but... Other than that, we don't know a whole lot about the spoken language, but what we have the hieroglyphs, so we can presume that they had a pretty complex written language from that. So, All right. Well, from Egypt, we're going to go to the opposite side of the world and talk about Kural in Peru, which coincidentally, we mentioned a news story about Kural a few episodes back, mm-hmm. uh, probably a couple months back. We're headed back there again in segment two. Back in a minute. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcripts. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code T-A-S. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Menards is your destination for concrete landscaping blocks. We have the largest in-stock selection at the lowest prices, ready to take home today. Plus, you can get free estimates fast using our landscape design programs in-store or on Menards.com. Say big on concrete landscaping blocks right now at Menards. View the weekly flyer and all of our great deals happening this week in-store or on Menards.com. Save big money at Menards. Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 114, and we are talking about, I guess, parallel things going on around the world at a certain time period, what was happening at different places in different times. Timelines. Timelines. And (laughs) we talked about Egypt, ancient Egypt, and now we're going to go to ancient Peru to a city called Kural and the people known as the Norte Chico. Yep. Norte Chico. Norte Chico? Yeah. North Chico. Is that like North Chico? Like California? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Chico means boy in Spanish, so... So, North Boy. Mm. All right. Corral's um. North Boy. Let's talk about him. <laughs> right. So, Spanish speakers, ignore us. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah, so I was super interested in this, both because of what you mentioned before the break, how we talked about this area is being encroached on by the local population sort of taking the land back for farming. 
which is interesting in itself because clearly it's good farmland, which plays mm-hmm. into, you know, talking about this society. Yeah. Also, I was reading about it and I was like, man, all of this sounds so familiar. And then I was reading some of the names of the people that have done the research and I was like, gosh, those names, they're so familiar. And I did my field school in Peru many, many, many years ago. Mm. <laughs> and we did take one field trip away from the area we were working on to visit this super old site. And at the time, this is like early 2000s, it was, you know, just coming out how old this site was. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it was, was Corral that we went to. So I feel even more connected to it because I'm pretty sure I visited it, but good God, that was 15 years ago. (laughs) So like, I could be totally wrong. Maybe we just visited like a satellite site or something like that, but Mm -hmm. it was definitely associated with some of this really old stuff. Now, like we've been saying, this is the same time period as Egypt. So just imagine in your brain that everything that happened over there, way, way over there in Egypt, is going on at the exact same time as everything that we are about to tell you about right now. See, and this is what blows me away about these concepts is these people had no idea that no. across the world there was a admittedly even larger society mm-hmm. doing crazy monumental things. And these guys are just like, you know, doing their own thing. Yeah. And even in other places of the same continent, there were things going on that these guys probably had no idea about. There just yeah. wasn't those kind of communication networks. Yeah, the like separateness of it all, but also like the human togetherness of it too. Because like even though though they're developing at different rates in different places, like it's still like development. Humans will always push forward and do better and create more and just speak to the human nature. I think that is one of the things that we're going to find out doing this series too. Is the Societies and people and city states and and organizations and civilizations around the world, even though they were developing in large part independently of each other, when you get up to around you know three thousand and four thousand years ago or so, the world was pretty small from the standpoint of it was small to you because you didn't know a whole lot about outside of you know where your area was. And I mean, even if you're traveling in a thousand mile radius, you know you got people that are going to venture out. That's still not very far in the context of the whole planet. Right. And yet society for, you know, 10,000 years was all kind of progressing at about the same rate. Yeah. You know, even though they evolved from common people, obviously, um, common stock, if you will, and then spread out across the planet, they were still developing Mm -hmm. at... I mean, essentially the same rate. There might have been a thousand years difference between one society getting pottery and and the other one doing, you know, not having pottery Mm -hmm. and then, you know, bronze and iron and stuff like that. But man, it's so crazy to me. And it wasn't until the Romans really started, you know, really exploring Europe and bringing their culture all over the place. And Mm -hmm. when I say bringing, I mean, destroying others and enforcing their own. And then, of course that turned into Europeans and England and everybody doing everything else. So, well, the one thing I'll say about that is humans always developed and it and yes it was developing at the same rates but just because one group didn't develop something or seemed to go slower i don't think that necessarily means that they were not developing as quickly or that they were somehow more primitive and no it's not a slide on their intelligence no, it's no. just not they don't have, they didn't have the influence to work together well there's that but this and this is why i picked corral because this is the most important thing or most interesting thing to me, it's a pre-ceramic society. So I know what you're thinking. You're immediately like pre-ceramic. They must have been super primitive. Like, why are we even comparing them? And yes, that's true. Pre-ceramic, obviously, they they just hadn't gotten to the point of figuring out how to make their own pots and things. Okay, It's not like they were borrowing them either. They just didn't have them. No, but they didn't need them because the kind of crops they had and the kind of animals they had, they were roasting things so Mm. they just they roasted everything and they have they have the fire pits and the hearts and all the things that prove that that was how they were cooking their food so when Mm, street tacos (laughs) right (laughs) so when you roast all your food then and you just eat it with your hands and it's very it's a very tactile type of process then what do you need a pot for i think they just went straight to plastic isn't that what I heard? <laughs> no? No? Um, I mean, yeah. there is a lot of plastic in Peru now. Oh, making yeah, up for right. last time, yeah, maybe? Yeah, I suppose. Oh, that was... Anyway. Uh, too soon. Mm, strike that. Okay. Moving on. So, let me just give you a quick background on Kral and the Norte Chico people, because their development is kind of interesting, too. Kral is a big, sprawling site, right? 
but it was mostly overlooked until 1948 because it was basically in a state of complete ruin. Nothing had been excavated, so they didn't know the extent of the structure there, number one. And also, there wasn't that many valuable artifacts that were easy to find on the surface, like the gold and the silver and that kind of stuff that they were finding in the Inca civilizations and other like pre-Inca stuff too. So this complex that didn't immediately appear as big as it actually is, is is quite large. There's six pyramidal type of structures, things. Bam, connection. <laughs> Similar, but not quite as sophisticated as the Egyptian structures. We have to be honest there. However, they are pretty crumbly looking. So they didn't go as high and it's kind of hard to tell exactly what the finished structure would have looked like. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there's monumental architecture there for whatever purpose it was. It appears that maybe they had put structures up on top of these pyramid type of structures. So they were leveled off at the top and there's some mm. kind of structure up there maybe. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot of information about what was going on there. And there's other like earthen platforms. Oh, and the sunken circular courts. Those are super interesting. They're almost like amphitheaters. And they're all over this place and clearly can accommodate a large number of people. So, again, big complex society was living like there. Sunken circular courts. Don't they always call those like ball courts in other parts of the yeah. you know, of that continent? They might. I am not. if it was sports related. I'm not sure. It sounds sure. like it was way bigger. It was bigger and it almost had like the steps along the side where uh, people could sit and watch something down yeah. inside of it. But not like a lot. There was like two levels of steps, at least in the photo that I saw of one of them. Hmm. So it's interesting. Again, I don't really think they know exactly what they were doing there. It was probably some kind of ceremonial something or another. That's although I think archaeologists use the word ceremonial to describe anything that they don't know, right? So if you don't know what it is, <laughs> hashtag ritual. <laughs> hashtag ritual. This is going to be our next t shirt. Oh my God. Head over to archpod.com forward slash shop <laughs> for all of our t shirt supplies. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Now I'm interested in the, the pyramidal structures because that seems to be a lot of early societies had pyramidal structures. I they mean, did. partly because just architecturally and geometrically uh, a pyramid is somewhat easy to make mm -hmm. right i mean soil if you're to just drop dirt out of the back of a dump truck if you've ever seen it just drop out of the back of a dump truck it sorts itself into like a pyramid right it's just a natural shape that you would see on the landscape if you were to move any sort of dirt and take a handful of it and drop it on the ground it's going to kind of drop itself in the shape of a of a mounded like pyramid thing yeah so having that as a structure that early societies built is is no surprise the fact that they decided to build these things out of stone, I don't know what the, these guys in Corral were doing, but it couldn't have been easy. And it would be interesting to see a study of construction techniques across the planet when it comes to pyramids, although we don't even know, right? There's yeah. so many theories around how the Egyptians built their pyramids from yeah. using kites and water and yeah. logs and just dragging things up with big ramps. And I don't know how, how they did it here in Corral, but that's super interesting to me. Yeah, I do know that the... The bricks in Kerala are, are like mud baked type of adobe mm. style bricks, which makes sense because it was like the high desert area. So. Those can be baked into like near concrete yeah. consistency. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've been in this area. I worked in this area and it's like frigid temperatures overnight and then hot, 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 hot during the day. So Isn't that Reno? Well, it's high desert there <laughs> high desert. too. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but Kerala... Like I said earlier, this is a thriving metropolis and it's happening at almost exactly the same time as the pyramids and the thriving community in Egypt was happening. So I just don't want to underestimate how important that this society was, you know, in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of, especially in South America. I think it is the oldest city that they found in the Americas, like of this, of this size and complexity. It's the oldest city in the Americas. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see some more detail about the prehistory of the area because that's another thing I'm interested in is like at the height of Corral versus, say, the height of, I mean, Egypt, Egypt, ancient Egypt lasted for, uh, it sounds like, much longer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because, I mean, to be honest, there's still millions and millions of people living in Cairo. Yeah. So did it ever really, you know, have nobody there? So for something like the last five to 7,000 years, there have been people in that area of Egypt. But I'm in interested to see... When people came to Corral, if we know that yet, and like how long it took them to 
develop into this type of society versus mm-hmm. say Egypt because Egypt if they really did have even if 1.6 million is off by a little bit it still had to be at least a million yeah right? it can't be off by that much yeah that's a lot of people and these monumental things you don't come to that overnight yeah and I think the difference here between Kral and Egypt is that Egypt had has the prehistory for Egypt begins sooner mm-hmm. than it does in Peru so they just had more time to to develop and more people in the same area and then the society was just bigger and more complex there was more money there was more time there's more everything they had artisans who you know like they had that super complex society with laborers that they could get this that kind of work done and crawl had a little bit of that you know because they did have agriculture and they did have a, a complex society and there were people that were building structures. So, well, and that's another thing we might have to bring up in another podcast. Maybe find a guest to talk about this because they always talk about, you know, the, the middle East, what we call now being the fertile crescent where agriculture first developed in this world mm-hmm. historically, but it didn't only develop there, which is the interesting thing. It's not like they invented agriculture in prehistoric Iran and right. said, here you go, rest of the world. Yeah, like handed it out like a gift Have to everyone. agriculture, everyone. <laughs> everyone else. Yeah and, yeah, and they weren't like, I'm going to head over to South America and do me some agriculture. Like that <laughs> right. didn't happen that way. Right, right. So where was the development of agriculture in other places? Yeah. You know, I mean, there were, there were societies that just never developed an agricultural practice because they didn't need to. They didn't like need a lot to. Of, yeah. Um, there were a lot of Native American groups that never developed agriculture. Yeah. They didn't yeah. need to. They had everything they needed. In fact, in our next segment, we'll be touching on the fact that there were still a lot of hunter-gatherer cultures yeah. in that area. So I really do think that we need to flip our mindset from thinking that one culture is more primitive compared to another and just think of it as one develop the skills and the things that they needed to survive on the land that they were living on. Why would they develop more if they didn't need more? You know, it's really like millennials and boomers. So (laughs) here we go. (laughs) Millennials like need the internet and their Snapchat accounts and TikTok and whatever else is a new thing that I've never even heard of. Whereas boomers are like, I don't even have a Facebook account (laughs) because I've evolved to not need one. So there's your there's your parallel right there. Yeah, I'm not so sure that quite works. <laughs> Although I will say, I haven't told you this yet. This is gonna be really fun for me to tell you. I made a TikTok account for the for APN today. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Look for uh, interpretive dance by Rachel <laughs> no! on our TikTok account. No, no, I'll put our audiograms on there anyway. Right. <laughs> okay, so moving on because we're going a little off the rails here. There's only a couple other things I wanted to say about Crawl. It was a very large and spread out complex, and it looks like it was spread out over 150 hectares or 370 acres. It contains tons of plazas, tons of residential buildings, and everything that you would see in a large complex society. Very similar to all the things that you see in like a basic Egyptian society, too, at this time. The difference being that there was fewer people here, which Mm -hmm. I'll talk about when we talk about our five points of comparison their population was was a lot smaller, probably. There's two other things I just want to say about this culture. There's a large geoglyph just outside of like the main structure, and it's it's huge. They it, they didn't even see it until like I don't know the 60s or 70s or something. But it's a large like human face with an open mouth, and it's similar to like uh, Nazca lines if you can think of that. I don't think it's quite on that scale, but it's really big, and that is interesting i guess we don't really know what time period it relates to but it is interesting that it is right outside of the one of the main complexes and the other thing that i found super fascinating because it's so easy to say that these primitive cultures they didn't have any art or whatever but they found tons and tons of flutes so they had music and music and art and that creativity it all kind of goes hand in hand so if you need a culture to have art in order to call it not primitive, bam, done. They had flutes. Yeah. There you go. Flutes. <laughs> flutes. <laughs> so our five points of comparison, let's talk about agriculture. Now, there's a bit of a debate over whether or not their diet was primarily seafood or if it was agriculturally produced, like maize or something like that. But likely it was a mix of both is kind of the conclusion that I've come to. Where'd they get the seafood? Didn't they live in the high desert? Right. So it's very close to the ocean. Like, yeah. like I think there's one Quick small walk down the hill yeah basically and there's a lot of satellite communities along the coast and 
this is the weird part is it looks like their, their staple crop was actually cotton, which mm. you can't eat. However, you make fishing nets with it, you send it out to the coast, and then the coast brings in fish, which is it yeah. kind of becomes your staple food, right? So I think they were just structured a little bit different differently than what you might think of. And again, it goes back to the idea of not all societies are going to be the same, and this one just figured out a way that worked for their area and mm-hmm. what they the resources that they could easily get access to. So there's a bit of a debate there. And the cotton and the fishing nets and stuff like that, it kind of comes into play in the next one, next bullet point, which is relationship with other surrounding groups. And again, we do think it's peaceful. There's no evidence of like the military presence or fortifications, no human remains that had major injuries or anything like that. And we definitely know that they traded with the coastal communities to get the fish and stuff like I was talking about with the nets. They probably traded cotton for fish and stuff like that. And there is some monkey depictions on some of the items Mm. that they found there. And that might mean that they were trading inland too to inland communities as far as Amazon, which is where monkeys would be. So I would assume somebody's done some sort of environmental analysis to see what this looked like 5,000 years ago. Maybe monkeys lived there. I think it was roughly the same. Yeah. Yeah. It? Okay. Yeah. It might have been colder because there was like the little ice age was going on, I think. Yeah. Or, yeah. or no, I guess it was the main ice age that was going on at that. I mean, it would have been near the tail end of it, but this is still like, yeah. you know, Peru. Yeah. And it's fairly close to the equator down there too. Yeah. So anyway, religion wise, the this is the whole, <laughs> you know, hashtag ceremonial, but there's a lot of these these structures that they think probably had some kind of ceremonial purpose. They just don't exactly know what it is. There's there's no ceramics with beautiful paintings on them telling them what people were doing there. So like that's the downside of a pre-ceramic culture, I guess. Mm-hmm. And the same with like their buildings and stuff. They I think they have some images of things, but just not enough to really give them an, a good idea of what they were worshiping and stuff like that. But they definitely had some kind of organized religion, something like that. So they say you can't judge a book by its cover. And I don't know who came up with that phrase because book covers are designed to illustrate what's inside the book. I wrote a book and there were many cover designs all (laughs) illustrating what was inside of the book. And it's very true with human nature as well. I mean, we kind of joke about defaulting to religion and things like that. But if you look around the world, there are a lot of commonalities with how people practice religion and spirituality and ceremonial purposes for similar societies. If you see all the signs, chances are this. It, it probably is. And, yeah. and it does seem like that was a big part of life because when you had a lot of things going on that you didn't know how to explain, you had to have something, you know? Yeah. So the second last point is population. They are estimating around 3,000 in Corral, the city, and then potentially like 20,000 in the whole area, which... You know, that's a lot less than Egypt. But I think, again, we're talking about sort of a carrying capacity thing almost here. Like that was what the land could could hold. And that was what the, the people grew into and yeah. and with the resources that they had. So, right. And oh, language and writing. Oh, man, this is one last really cool point. So I'll bring it up quickly. But we don't really know much about what their spoken language was. However, there is evidence that they had a kipu there. Mm. And kipus are made of cotton, which we know they had cotton. And they're these strands of yarn. Nuts. Yeah, yarn for lack of a better word, because I'm a knitter and you know, everything relates to yarn for me. So strands of yarn with knots in them, and those knots would would convey information. Right. Probably of a just a record keeping type of information, mm-hmm. not necessarily like a narrative kind of information. I don't think they were using yeah. it to tell stories so much. No, I've heard of things like inventories and things like yeah. that. They yeah. They kept on kipus, although they're very difficult to read. So they are. And they're very complex. And one last note about this kipu in particular is you have to put pretty big air quotes around it. There's debate as to whether or not it is actually a kipu. I saw the picture. I mean, it looks like strands with knots in it. Yeah. But it's also not hard to do if you own a bunch of cotton. No, but there's like a huge stretch of time between that one that they found, you know, 2,600 years ago and the next most recent one. There's like a thousand years between them or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, but where's the evidence? Like, where's the evidence in between those two examples? So. All right. Well, if you've uh, felt a lack of pottery in your life for the last 20 minutes. We're going to move over to China and solve that problem. Yeah. Back in a minute. 
You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 114. And we are talking about our third parallel timeline here, and that is China and Rachel and I have been talking about this show for a long time, this type of show for a long time. And every time I thought about what we would talk about in this, I kept thinking, man, I have no idea what's going on in China. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You learn about so many things and it's just like, man, I literally have no idea what's going on in China right now. Like in school, it's like Great Wall, Terracotta Army. Okay, done. Move on. But China managed. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I always remember China from the TV show MASH. Because uh, I know it's like an old thing. You remember Mash, the I, army show? I think I'm a little young even for reruns, They're but maybe somebody was because they were in like Vietnam or something. Yeah, and one of the guys was like talking down about the Asians, basically the Asians. Let's call it the Asians in the 70s. And uh, and he said, you know, they invented movable type in 1492. And and the one guy who was like the lead, he's like, I know, I was in 1491 and I didn't sleep all night. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't think it was 1492, whatever the date was. Oh, my God. They, like, invented a lot of stuff. And, oh, my God, I always remember that joke. Yeah. And it's from MASH. Okay, China. Get it. <laughs> That's good. Quote old racist TV shows. <laughs> That's a great way to start this segment. <laughs> and <laughs> moving on. <laughs> so, we are, like you said, going to China, to a Neolithic culture, like all these have been. And we're in northern China. In the Yellow River region, and the culture is called the, oh boy, here we go with the names again, Majiao culture? Majiao. Majiao? Who knows? Okay. Well, go ahead and write us if we said that wrong and correct us. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, make sure you put the phonetic spelling in the email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a Neolithic culture, and... Honestly, I was reading about them and I really wanted to include them and there's a specific reason why. But I actually had a lot of trouble finding information about this culture and this area specifically. And part of me wondered if maybe it was because of like that sort of information block between China and the US, like maybe stuff isn't getting to us. But I'm not sure that affects academics so much maybe it does Mm -hmm. i'm not really totally sure but i definitely did not find a lot of information on this area and part of that is because there's like two over two thousand known sites that are of this time period however only like 50 of them have been excavated ever like ever ever Mm. so they just nobody has put no i'm sorry that's not true i don't want to disqualify the efforts of people who have worked in this area, but there just hasn't been a lot of interest in these groups. Well, now it's got to be said too, that the Chinese for the past, I mean, as, as long as I can remember, uh, for the past last century anyway, uh, or at least after world war two, 
you know, have been a communist government, very insular, just like Russia has, mm -hmm. very private, and, and I don't want to say secretive necessarily, but kind of secretive. So there could be a ton of research that just the wider world That's just, just not doesn't getting know about. out. Yeah, not yeah. filtering out. It's possible. Yeah. But but what drew my eyes to this culture over and over again, and I swear I tried to dismiss it like several times. I was going to do Stonehenge instead, which, yeah. you know, quick side note, Stonehenge is basically the same time period as the pyramids as well. But it's just too well known. I wanted something that people didn't know about it. And this really fit the bill. And what kept bringing it up and up again and again is their pottery. And oh, my gosh, it is yeah. just beautiful and i'll put some pictures in the show notes on our website so you can see but it's incredible painted pottery very thin very very well-formed pottery they had an amazing technique for creating these pots and then the paintings on them they're they're painted in black pigment and they've got these sweeping parallel lines and dots and then in later periods they would have, add sort of these like curvilinear shapes and also added red pigment to the paint as well so it just it sort of developed got to more and more but they're just these incredible examples of pottery and things that in comparison I don't think we saw until much later time periods in other parts of the world as far as quality goes so that's why I decided to include them mm -hmm. And as you might imagine, I think a lot of the efforts of their society went towards perfecting this pottery. They had large centralized workshops and there has been some excavations of those. They know that that was happening. It was almost like mass production by the middle of the of the time period where there were huge workshops that were dedicated to making these pots. They had a hand wheel. They were wheel turning these pots. Nice. I don't know what the the date range of the wheel is it was a hand wheel or a hand crank type of thing obviously mm -hmm. not the foot pedal thing yet but still they were wheel turning these pots and uh it just took an incredible amount of infrastructure to make all of this happen and like with everything they started mass producing this pottery yep and anytime you start mass producing something the quality declines yep the quality declines and it it really parallels the decline in this particular society as well mm -hmm. with the decline in quality. And in one of the papers, somebody called it the Walmart effect. <laughs> I saved that little snippet just for nice. you because I knew you would love that. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah, but it's true. The quality really went down by the end of end of their time period, as, you know. Yeah. Oddly enough, most of the stuff in Walmart is made in China. So <laughs> that's kind of weird, right? <laughs> Yes, but <laughs> no, because it wasn't made 5,000 years ago in China. Well, that's true. That's true. So, Yeah, but these beautiful pots that they made, uh, they were used for funeral rituals. And that appears to be a really significant part of whatever their religious practices were. It was these really elaborate funeral processes i don't think they were used as urns necessarily they weren't like there wasn't cremations with the ashes of the body going in it was more like they were offering they were used in offerings mm. for something during the morning process right. right and that was the big thing that really drove this society they had agriculture they had the other things they were pretty small they had no monumental architecture that i could see no pyramids or anything like that going on but I think that that has to do with the, again, they didn't need it in the area that they were living yeah. in. And, and their efforts were focused on making these pots. Their skilled workers were, were learning how to make these pots, not learning how to make giant bricks to turn into pyramids. Mm -hmm. So just in a different direction of focusing their effort. Right. Was very interesting to me. And then the very tail end of the dominance of the society in this area is when bronze finally comes to the area. So we're kind of like creeping into the bronze period with, with this group of people. There's definitely some yeah. overlap near the end there. So getting to our five points of comparison here, agriculture-wise, like I mentioned, they were an agriculture-based society. Millet was probably their main crop, and then they also had rice as well. Those, those were their stable crops, and that was basically how they fed everybody. They probably had domesticated pigs, and that was sort of the base of their diet there was those items. Bacon and rice. <laughs> B 
bacon and rice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and millet. Why would you make pyramids when you live on bacon and rice? I mean, it sounds like the perfect diet to me yeah. personally, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. As far as their relationship to other groups, they definitely were trading a lot. They traded this specialized pottery that they were making. And we know that because they have found, they found examples of it in, at sites, you know, way over on the Eastern coast and in other places. So Mm -hmm. it was this prized item that they could probably help to supplement their society with whatever they weren't able to grow themselves. A probably fairly peaceful as far as that goes. I, I didn't see any evidence of warring or stuff, but again, we've got some holes in our knowledge on this, this group of people, at least in Western society, we have holes because we just don't have access. I couldn't find open access to these things. Their religion, again, mostly unknown, but it's probably shamanistic. This painted pottery was very significant, like I said, and it it played a major role in whatever their funeral funeral rites were, which indicates some kind of pretty strong religious presence, whatever it might have been for them. Population. This is basically unknown again they lived in these dispersed villages sort of dotted along the main rivers in the region and we just don't really have any idea how many people it was it was probably in the thousands but we don't have a good a good estimate and again that probably comes from lack of data i bet we could get a good estimate if there were more excavations and more people interested in finding out the answer to that question right so future archaeologists Go study, (laughs) go study these people. (laughs) And then language wise, we don't know. That's a big question mark. I don't know. We don't know what kind of language they had. They must have had a language, but we don't know. Wow. There was no, there was no writing or early, early Chinese on the, uh, not that I saw not, no, no writing on the pots. It's all very geometric design. That's interesting. Cause they, (sighs) I imagine, I mean, they had language. They spoke yeah, to each other. They Obviously, must you can't have this kind of culture without transmitting those ideas. Right. But a written language, I mean, that, that, that only comes about because of necessity. Right. You know, and maybe they didn't have a necessity for it in that area. I don't know. I'd be interested to see the history of the, the, because I think I saw in some of these texts, some of these sources that you had here that I read that, you know, the Chinese written language, what do they call it? Traditional or simplified Chinese or something like that? Yeah. It goes back a long ways. It does. Yeah. I mean, we might not have yeah. any evidence here, but maybe they didn't have anything that survived that they wrote on. Yeah. You know? And I did go down a little bit of a rabbit hole trying to find language because when I decided on my points of comparison between the three different civilizations, I wanted to have at least something for each <laughs> each yeah. one. And so I started trying to like research ancient Chinese language and I just it gets so sketchy when you go back that far they might have had something I just couldn't connect definitively to this specific group of people right all right well that uh, about does it for this first uh, timelines episode what do you think we should use as an anchor event for future episodes yeah and again I like it to be something really well known like yeah. if you say to just about anybody on the street, hey, have you heard of this? Stonehenge is something we mentioned. The pyramids are a good one. Mm-hmm. In the in this country, in the United States, we could say Cahokia. If you're in the Midwest, you know what Cahokia is. Right. You know, what was going on when, when Cahokia was happening? Other things, you know. It doesn't even have to be prehistoric, really. I'm kind of interested in other stuff as mm-hmm. well, like, you know, the, the founding of London. Yeah. You know, what was happening when London was becoming a city? What was happening in other parts of the globe or or Rome or, you know, Cairo for that matter? Yeah, there's some interesting parallel civilizations that you don't actually think of. And I would love to hear what civilization jumps straight into your mind when you think, wow, that place was awesome. I would love to get in my time machine and go back there and visit. Like, what are those places? Because that would be perfect to use as an anchor point, a jumping off point to be like, well, you think you want to go back and see what was happening when... William the Conqueror took over 1066 in England. You think you want to go? Well, maybe you don't actually. That was probably a pretty, pretty dirty and bloody yeah, time. But, not <laughs> but so great. you think you want to go back and experience that. But I'm gonna tell you what happened over here on the other side of the world, and that yeah. could be way more interesting. So we'll always try to start with the the anchor event or civilization or time period or something like that. But like I, 
I really want to know, you know, more about China. You know, what was happening there? What was happening in Russia before yeah. it was Russia? Yeah. You know, that whole yep. that whole northern part of the continent there. Like, what was going on up there? Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, doesn't Russia span two continents? It's both Asia and Europe. Yeah. I don't know where the split is. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, what was happening in that area? Yeah, you know? we definitely. Yeah. We we don't as Americans specifically probably our European audience has a little bit more history because of proximity but mm-hmm. as Americans we just don't we hear the highlights mm-hmm. and and not even that many of those yeah like you said with China it's like Great Wall done right yeah like we know about that now and also because it was a Tom Cruise movie so now we all know about the Great Wall of China <laughs> oh my so God. there you go <laughs> wait what was that movie called I don't even know but I think he fought like monsters or something on the oh. wall oh that's was it like right. aliens or something. Like, Oh. That's why they built the wall. Oh, that's right. It's like yeah. a weird sci-fi <laughs> fantasy type of thing. And he wasn't even Asian. Like no. he was visiting or there. Yeah. He was called in as like a warrior. So many problems. Because the Chinese couldn't handle it. Bring in the white man. So many problems, yeah. man. Yeah, so many problems. Yeah. So anyway. All right. Well, again, send in your suggestions for what place or time period or culture you'd like to know about. And maybe we'll try to find the opposite, find the anchor event, but also send us your 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 favorite anchor events. Yeah. And we'll uh, see if we can find some parallel timelines around that. Yeah, definitely. And if you're listening to this and you're an archaeologist or historian and you're an expert in a specific time period or place or something and you want to talk about that segment, Come on in. Let's do it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Chris at Archaeology Podcast Network for all of that. Also, if you want to help support us, arcpodnet.com forward slash members. You may have heard this at the beginning or end of the show. Also, you can go to arcpodnet.com forward slash shop. Just go to arcpodnet.com. There's a lot of stuff there. But yeah, for forward sure. slash members, you can support us monthly. If you want a t-shirt, if you want, we got some cool designs, uh, a lot of neat stuff. Not just t-shirts either. If you want a new phone case, if you want a, a Android or I, uh, iOS, if you want a, uh, a pillow. I had an APN <laughs> pillow that when we moved into an RV, I had to part ways with. I'm a little sad about that. <laughs> I'll let you keep it for a little while, but like Ugh. there were too many pillows for this 300 square foot RV. I I know. How many pillows does one RV need? So And you refuse to use any of them. So I hate pillows. Yes. But I loved my APN pillow. Oh, you love looking I at it. I don't know why. So <laughs> anyway, lots of cool stuff on there. Go check it out. All that helps us, you know, keep doing these podcasts and and keep the light on. I mean, we're recording this at, you know, late in the evening on a Friday. So because Shh. that's how it works. Don't tell them that. <laughs> God. I won't tell them which Friday. So Anyway, it's the night before it goes out. No, that's not true. <laughs> All right. So thanks for listening. Send us your suggestions. You can go to the website, leave a note on the contact form there. Pretty much anonymous if you don't want to just send us an email. Chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. And please, please, please check out the membership, the store, and all the other fantastic shows on the APN. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. You can also find us on the Lyceum app, a podcast app just for educational podcasts. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info. What makes for a great vacation? Depends on who you ask. Are you looking to get away or bring everyone together? Do you want to get outside and play or see a play at the plate? Fortunately, however you operate, I'm the destination you've been looking for. The name's Missouri, but you can call me Mo. And I have just one question. What's your MO? Come see me at visitmo.com. 
Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.